Hello hackers. Welcome to another video in the Pwn College shell coding module. Today we'll be talking about data execution protection. Just very briefly, if you remember the three Johns from our computer architecture fundamentals, the three Johns gave us what is now called the John von Neumann architecture. They uh, proposed this architecture that basically um, treats code and data in the same way, right? They're all stored in memory. They're all read into your CPU cache and so forth and so on. Uh, and this causes problems. As we have seen throughout this module, this allows us to inject data as if it were code and have it executed. And uh, chaos ensues. We had brought down the internet in 1988 uh it uh, you know as as um an exploit that involved shell code and it is uh caused you to have to tackle a lot of challenge problems that we prepared for you it's a pretty interesting side effect of this design decision so sometime uh relatively recently um as in the last i don't know maybe almost two decades computer architecture designers started thinking well what if we treat the data and code slightly differently right just a little bit and um data execution protection was born um modern architectures support permissions on data these permissions can be can we read this data can we write these this data and can we execute this data so these constants prod read prod write prod exec are from um, you know the mmap and mprotect system calls. You can actually use them to define the permissions of memory that you are mapping or or um, changing the permissions of. Um, the intuition behind this was: look, normally all the data in your uh, that text segment in your elf, that's what needs to be executable. No one needs to execute. Not no one, but usually you don't need to execute the stack. Sometimes you do, but that, that's rare. And in those cases, you'll deal with it yourself, right? By default, let's make sure nothing on the stack can be executed. Nothing in the program code can be changed. Everyone will be happy, right? Um, in different systems, this is called different things. On Windows, it tends to be called DEP, Data Execution Protection. On Linux uh, systems, it, it is frequently referred to as NX, the no execute uh, bit. Um, it has been called, or uh, WXORX. This is uh, very difficult to write because it involves an XOR, sometimes written as W plus X. Um, that conveys the idea that something should never be executable and writable at the same time. Uh, known uh, by a lot of different things, but generally speaking, data execution protection prevents your shellcode, any data that you inject from being able to execute. So is that the end of shellcode? Well, it might not be that, but it uh, definitely hurts. Um, Shellcode, in some way, is now a little bit of an ancient art practiced by uh, mysterious, wise hackers. Um, it's still very, very much around in embedded devices. There's still a lot of embedded devices that don't have good uh, data execution protection. Um, and it is around in uh, kind of the, the general purpose computing landscape as well in a number of different ways that we'll discuss in this lecture. So let's talk about kind of the, the remaining uh, data uh, uh, shellcode injection uh, methods. Uh, thing number one, um, the, the kind of most straightforward way to talk about it is, well, you can use a system called a system call called mprotect to actually change the permissions of memory to make it executable and writable, right? Uh, this is kind of a chicken and egg problem because usually in order to do that, you already have to have some high level of control over a program. Uh, a very common way in uh, hacking challenges to do it is through return-oriented programming. Uh, which we will talk about in a future module, but you basically create a small return-oriented program, program 
to uh, and protect a piece of memory and then you uh, run your shell code out of that. Um, other cases are very situational. It really depends on what is the program designed to do, what is the vulnerability and so forth. Um, it is not impossible to uh, have this happen, especially as a result of a race condition or something along these lines, um, but it's a, a situational scenario. Um, a large class of scenarios where shellcode does still exist uh, involve just-in-time compilers. Uh, just-in-time compilers were created to allow you to uh, run JavaScript very, very, very quickly, right? Uh, the idea is you take interpreted language, it doesn't just have to be JavaScript, um, or, uh, you know, Java bytecode or something along these lines, and at uh, runtime, if you feel that it would help you run things faster, you compile that uh, a little bit of code at a time, just in time to, to run it. Uh, just on a compilation is a little bit outside of the scope of this course in general. Uh, look it up um, if you're interested. There's you know a lot of resources on the internet to learn about it. But the general idea is you're generating code. You're generating binary code that needs to be able to run. So that binary code that is generated needs to be able to be written somewhere and then executed from there, right? The safe thing to do would be to memory map a place just for it to write the code to then and protect that place so that uh, that that memory location so that it is no longer writable, then up, uh, execute that code. If you need to update it, uh, just in time compilers are usually incremental, so they'll have to update it, uh, code over time. You need to once again and protect it to be writable, um, and then once again and protect it to be executable only. Um, this is the safe thing to do. Right, but system calls are slow, so this is also an extremely slow thing to do. In fact, an approach like this likely um, is uh, going to have enormous overhead. And the point of just-in-time compilation is to be very fast to 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 speed things up. And slow and safe tends to lose out over fast. As a result, writable and executable pages are common, right? And it's it gets a little worse even if your program uses a library that uses writable and executable pages, then those are pages are in your memory space, right? So you're vulnerable too. But let me show you um, just how common um, these are. Uh, let's see if I can do this without spewing secrets all over the place. Um, talked about the slash proc file system before. Here in slash proc, we have um, directories for, for all the processes running on a machine. So let's just grab through all of these processes. Uh, there's a, a file for each of these pro process IDs. Self is just a uh, symlink to my current. So this would be a symlink to LS's process ID, which is pretty cool. Um, all super dynamic and everything. All right, if we uh, grab all of these process maps for the word, for the, the, the um, permissions RWX, right? Ideally, we wouldn't see any, but we see a lot. We see a lot of files that match these permissions. And we can use our friend Parallel to run more commands here. If we, let's see if this works. Um, uh, let's, yeah, okay. Maybe just take the base name slash x. All of these programs have a page mapped in memory that is writable and executable. And there are some heavy hitters in here. X, my freaking uh, uh, graphical interface. We have Zoom. Zoom it has a writable and executable page. If there is shellcode injection in Zoom, now there's a place for that shellcode to execute from Firefox. Well, it has a just-in-time compiler. It's possible it's there. I'm actually curious. I didn't think it was. Obviously, this is a little off script. So where's the RWX? 
I don't see it. Well, actually, let's be smart about this. Oh, it's in an NVIDIA library. So here, I mean, for some reason, this library has writable and executable uh, uh, page mapped. And as a result, uh, now uh, my Firefox does as well. Um, who else was on this list? Uh, some GNOME components, Discord and Slack, open broadcast system. Um, I bet this is because it's Electron apps. Anyways, a lot of things have writable and executable code even on my system, even my system. All right, um, so obviously this could still allow some shell code action. Let's move on. Um, what if the JIT was safe, right? Well, you can still uh, attack it given certain scenarios. Um, there's a technique called JIT spraying. So imagine uh, just-in-time uh, compiler would need to compile all of your code that all of your, your, your um, JavaScript code, for example, into binary. If your JavaScript code has constants that happen to have the values of valid x86 assembly, they might end up in memory that is executable. Now, there are mitigations that have been developed for this as well, but, but the general concept still stands. You could end up, because you might be a malicious website that can run its own JavaScript in a browser, you might be able to cause things to be just in time compiled and placed into uh, memory in ways that you more or less control. And then by triggering a vulnerability to redirect code to there, you're running shellcode. Um, this also happens, uh, by the way. Um, all right, and and JIT, this isn't just a theoretical um, problem, right? JIT uh, is everywhere. Uh, it's 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 in your browser. It's in a lot of uh, you know uh, software that you're using. It's in your uh, JavaScript interpreter for sure in your uh, Lua interpreter, in uh, your Python interpreter, if you're using PyPy, uh, et cetera. It's uh, a very useful thing, but it reopens this attack vector. Um, another mitigation, just a preview, because we're gonna move on to this uh, in the next module. Um, what happens if we say, okay, fine, the attacker is gonna run their shellcode somehow? but can we prevent that shellcode from doing a lot of damage? Stay tuned.